My name is Matthew Wilson. I serve as the mobility manager for the Georgia Department of Transportation and as the project manager for this plan. And I want to thank you all for attending this afternoon. Just a few virtual housekeeping items. Uh, first, we ask that you please keep your mic on mute during the presentation. This en ensures that everyone is able to hear the presentation clearly. For those using a computer or smartphone, this is the microphone icon with a slash through it. For those on the phone, we ask that you please mute your phone. As we progress through the presentation, uh, we have a couple scheduled breaks for questions and discussion. Please ask or provide a comment. Uh, this workshop is designed for us to better understand rural and human service transportation in your region, and your active participation is highly encouraged. When asking a question or making a comment during these times, please use the raise hand feature in Teams. This is the icon with the smiley face and the hand. Uh, alternatively, you can use the chat box feature to type in your question, which is in the comment bubble icon. Our team member, Jaquita, will be monitoring the hand raise and chat box during the entire workshop. If you're on the phone calling in, you will be unable to raise your hand or use the chat box. So during the discussion segments, we will ask if anyone on the phone would like to speak. Uh, please unmute your phone and begin speaking. A little bit about the RHSS team. So the 2050 RHST plan is a three agency plan. I'll speak more about this in the coming slides. The Georgia Departments of Transportation, Human Services, and Community Health are the plan sponsors. The plan is being developed with the help of a consultant team comprised of AECOM, Cambridge Systematics, and Modern Mobility Partners. Today, we're going to run through the following topics. I will provide a brief introduction and some background on rural and human service transportation in Georgia. I will then hand it off to Will Brewer from AECOM to review the available transit and transportation services in the Three Rivers region. After, Baird Breen from Cambridge Systematics will walk us through the region's transit needs. And then Kirsten Mote from Modern Mobility Partners will guide our discussion ses session. Uh, we'll also have a couple question and discussion points throughout the workshop today. So what exactly is rural and human service transportation? Not many people may be familiar with the terms. Rural and Human Service Transportation, or RHST, are mobility services provided for the benefit of disadvantaged populations, including persons with disabilities, older adults, and persons without a vehicle. RHST includes services provided by public transit operators, human service agencies, private providers, and private nonprofit agencies. This 2050 RHST plan seeks to do a few things. First, do an update of the existing conditions information. Uh, we're going to build upon recommendations and efforts completed in prior plans, and then we're going to identify projects, programs, and policies to meet current and future up to 2050 demands and provide enhancements to RHST across Georgia. I mentioned that this is a three agency plan. This is because the state of Georgia administers three systems to provide public transit, human services, transportation, and non-emergency medical transportation, or NEMT. Each system is administered by a different state agency using different funding sources. GDOT focuses on public transit for rural and small urban populations. DHS focuses on transportation services for seniors, low-income families, individuals with disabilities, and vocational training, while DCH focuses on transportation to medically necessary services for eligible Medicaid members. Coordination uh, exists at the state, regional, and local levels. However, each agency system operates independently using a variety of service delivery models with differing requirements. The state's role in governing transit is primarily to oversee compliance with federal grant requirements. There is no single state authority to set priorities for public transit and human service transportation or to coordinate planning and funding of transit services for rural communities. A little bit of history on the RHST plan. Uh, back in 2007, the Georgia Departments of Human Services and Transportation completed the Coordinated Public Transit Human Services Transportation Plan. As an update to that plan, GDOT initiated the Georgia Rural and Human Services Transportation Plan 2.0 in 2011. The Plan 2.0 outlined coordination activities among the rural public and human services transportation providers across the state to achieve improved service delivery for the state's public transportation and human services transportation customers. 
The plan also developed recommendations to implement mobility management at the state and regional level. In 2001, GDOT, DHS, and DCH began developing an update, the 2050 Georgia RHST plan. The purpose of this plan is to provide a framework for additional coordination among Georgia's agencies impacted by mobility services and continue the work of the technical coordinating group, which is now renamed the technical advisory group and expand its participation to additional stakeholders. A quick look at our plan schedule. You can see we have wrapped up our vision and goals, which I will discuss on the next slide and are heading into our existing conditions and needs assessment and beginning our alternatives analysis. What I want to focus on today is how to get people involved in this process. And now we can get input from your region to help us understand needs and develop solutions. The stars on the schedule indicate stakeholder and public outreach events. Those with a pink circle indicate the technical advisory group meetings. Outreach is a, a key component of the RHST plan update and ensures the agencies updating the plan fully understand the rural and human service transition needs across the state. The technical advisory group, which includes three state agencies sponsoring the plan, as well as representatives from regional commissions, the statewide independent living council of Georgia, and other stakeholders identified during our stakeholder engagement process. I'm pleased to see a few of them attending the workshop this afternoon. We are engaging stakeholders and the public in each of the 12 regions in Georgia through these regional workshops. We are also conducting a statewide survey for RHST providers and a separate survey for riders, the link to which is on the QR code on the slide. These efforts will help provide all Georgians an opportunity to access the status of the RHST plan update and identify key needs and service coordination strategies. Additionally, public feedback will be elicited through the 30 day public review and comment period for the draft RHST plan update, which we are targeting for July. The RHST vision and goals are structured from the statewide transit plan, which was uh, developed in 2020. Our vision statement outlines where we would like rural and human service transportation to be in 2050, which is to continue and grow statewide rural and human service transportation coordination to improve the quality of life and economic activities for all Georgians, specifically those in rural areas, those with disabilities, older adults, and persons without vehicles. Our six goals, again based on the statewide transit plan, outline how we seek to implement the vision. The first goal is to provide coordinated and efficient rural and human services transportation. The second is to provide a safe and sustainable RHST network. The third is to optimize public transit programs to best meet public transit systems and travelers' needs. The fourth is to ensure public transit coverage across the state to ensure mobility and access for all. The fifth is to connect rural transit to regional and urban centers. And finally, the sixth is to leverage technology and innovation to support public transit ridership and performance. I would now like to hand it off to Will Brewer from AACOM to walk through the available transit in the Three Rivers region. Will? Great. Um, thank you, Matt. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Matt mentioned, my name is Will Brewer. I am a transportation planner on the AECOM team. Um, happy to see so many folks joining us today. So I just wanted to give you a brief snapshot of some of the data and um, transit uh, status and service areas that we are showing each of our regions in these workshops. <clears throat> these are three statewide maps, so I'm going to just take a few minutes here to uh, explain what's going on in your region um, for a little bit more detail. Um, so, you know, we're looking at basically three different areas, uh, public transit, human services, service areas, and non-emergency medical. Um, as you can see in yellow, we have our three regions, regional transit, uh, very coordinated. We have inner um, multi-county region here. Uh, also, two rural counties um, uh, that provide transit services as well. And in gray, we have Coweta, which we're acknowledging as urban. It is in, it is in the uh, ATL uh, region, so we've, we've identified that as urban. Um, moving over to human services. Um, really what we want you to focus on are these other parties that are that are involved. So we have our Division of Aging, um, our Division of Family and Children's Services, and our Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Um, as you can see, everything is um, pretty well covered in three regions, but uh, just uh, three rivers, excuse me, uh, in that region. But we just wanted you all to kind of take a closer look and make sure that we have everything correct. Uh, and lastly, we have our non-emergency medical um, by DCH. 
Um, so Motive Care um, and Southeast Trans are the two brokers that operate within the state, five different regions. As you can see, we've got majority of the region covered um, in the central region by Motive Care, and Motive Care is also um, still operating within the region, just in another county. Uh, it's just separated into a different region as um, Southwest. Um, really, that's just the snapshot. We're going to re visit these maps just to here in a few minutes, but I'd like to hand it over to Kirsten so we can kind of pause and um, and go from there. Kirsten? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm Kirsten Moat. I'm with Modern Mobility Partners. Uh, so first, we do have several people on, um, on the call today. Um, I just want to pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions um, so far. If not, we're going to move into a little polling exercise. So um, for those that have a computer or a smartphone available, we invite you to join our uh, our poll. We use Mintmeter. So you can access Mintmeter either by the QR code that is on your screen, or you can go to the website www.menti.com, and you're going to enter an eight-digit code. It's going to be 2420-9691. So I'll give everybody a minute to get logged on there. Once you get logged in, you'll see on your screen it just says instructions. And so the first question that we want to ask you, and it's it's open ended and you can submit as many responses as you like, is based on the maps that we'll just walk through with you. And I'm going to go back to them in just a second. What transportation services are we, are we missing? Are we showing any incorrect information? Are there other transportation providers out there that we're not capturing in this? Um, we just want to make sure that as a part of our needs assessment and our existing conditions that we're reflecting everything accurately. Uh, I think we can all agree that transportation can be a complex topic in Georgia with as many counties as we have. Um, I would say that Three Rivers over the course of 10, 15 years has done a really good job to try to coordinate and uh, quote unquote simplify um, the transportation solutions in that area but again we want to make sure that we are reflecting information accurately so i've brought these up again on the screen and if you don't have access to a computer or a smartphone to access the poll please feel free to raise your hand and we will call on you and we can unmute you and you can provide your response so again, on the public transit side, we do have the Three Rivers Regional Transit, which covers several counties, including Merriweather, Pike, Spalding, Upson, Lamar, Butts, and Carroll. Coweta County provides their own transit system. And then Herd and Troop also provide their own transit systems. Right. On the human services side, as Will mentioned, everything is pretty accurate or pretty um, well, it is covered. It's covered by all three DHS service areas of aging, Department of Family and Children's Services, and the behavioral health and developmental disabilities. And then the non emergency medical care, everything is covered by mode of care, but they are in two separate regions across the state, Upson County being in Southwest, the rest of Three Rivers being in the central region. I'm just going to go back and see if we have any responses. All right, so we have one response here at Three Rivers. We don't have any input or coordination with the non-emergency medical operation. Thank you for that response. Um, I, I think that that is a common theme across the state that the non-emergency medical transportation kind of operates through their brokers and then the brokers have several third party transit operators and the services between either um, public transit or DHS services are hard to coordinate because of so many third party operators. 
that's a great comment though. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to move on to the second question now. So thinking about the existing services that are out there and how you operate, um, what are some of the constraints that you're running up against? What are what are some of the heartburn issues that you have? Um, maybe as we have examples here, maybe you are unable to provide service during certain days of the week. Uh, or maybe there's certain times a day that you can't provide service, although you would like to or you feel that there's a demand for it. Um, I think across the board, uh, funding is always a constraint that comes up. So if that is the case here, you know, please um, provide that input. But any sort of complaint that you're having constraint you're having on your existing system, we would love to hear about it now. And again, you can enter them through the Minty. Um, you can also raise your hand and we will call on you, or you can enter your response into the chat box. So I think um, on our on our last workshop, um, one one of the constraints that we heard that I thought was really interesting is that a lot of these trans a lot of transportation services transitioned to uh, providing meals for seniors at home during COVID, um, and now that there's more demand to go to de uh, medical appointments or other services. Um, they're they're finding constraints of being able to balance still providing meals to people in their homes um, and trying to provide the transportation services for people that are going out and getting um, getting medical services. So uh, we have one response here that says the number of vehicles, the flexibility between public and DHS transportation, finding drivers to operate the vehicles, and um, it can be added that COVID is holding us back. So I think those are all uh, all good points. So a lack of vehicles, a lack of drivers for vehicles, um, not much flexibility between public and DHS transportation and how they can be used. And then of course COVID. And then we have another response, unable to provide services on weekends. And we do not have the number of drivers to support extended hours during weekdays. Thank you. This is great. I want to add one more to you, Kirsten. I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, yeah. Tommy says that we are we are experiencing significant cost increases, particularly for fuel and drivers' pay. I think that's a great point. Um, labor labor costs are certainly going up. Fuel costs are going up. I mean, the cost for everything is going up. Our grocery bills are going up. Um, so yeah, the, the, the cost per trip, um, or costs per hour are, are increasing and I'm going to go ahead and put out an assumption and, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but you're not really considering any fare increases to cover those costs either. At least on the public transit side. Not at this time. OK, great. Well, thank you guys for that input. Um, that's really helpful. All of these are being recorded, so we're going to compile all of these and and pull them into our needs assessment. Ultimately, what we're trying to do, as Matt mentioned, is use this input to come up with programs, um, projects and policies uh, that may help alleviate some of these constraints um, and help facilitate more coordination across the state to make transit and transportation not only more accessible, but also more, to, more affordable for the providers and the riders. Okay, so we're gonna switch back to presentation mode. I'm gonna move it over to Mr. Barry Bream with Cambridge Systematics. He's gonna talk to you about what we are seeing from uh, some of the data and the survey responses that we've gotten so far. So Baird, I will let you take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we will be presenting our uh, preliminary findings for the quantitative and qualitative elements of the needs assessment, 
which is designed to produce uh, an understanding of transit demand, transit needs, and priorities uh, within the, the uh, region and uh, ultimately uh, across the entire state for uh, rural and uh, human services transportation. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to, to set us up a little bit, the needs assessment consists of uh, two main ways of analyzing transit demand. Uh, these two types of transit demand analysis are consistent with the uh, statewide transit plan that GDOT conducted uh, in 2019 and 2020. And the methodology itself is based on a, a national approach recommended by the Transit Cooperative Research Program. So the overall methodology has uh, 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 is seen as pretty robust and, and pretty reliable. Now the methodology relies on uh, two analyses of uh, demographic information and travel information, uh, specifically stemming from information produced by the American Community Survey, which is uh, managed by the US Census Bureau. The reason why we're using 2019 as our base year uh, for this analysis is because 2019 is the most recent uh, set of data that is available from uh, the American Community Survey. And then uh, in addition to that, we use information uh, from uh, the National Transit Database reports that uh, your agencies uh, prepare and submit. So this information is designed to give us a, a kind of good detailed county level analysis of transit demand that we aggregate into the, the regional level and present here. So the non-program, uh, and I'm sorry, the, the, the two types of analysis are the non-program demand and the mobility gap demand assessment. The non-program demand assessment is seen as the lower bound estimate for this methodology, and it consists of uh, uh, transit demand, basically transit demand through proxy, based on the, the number of people that belong to certain demographics that are more likely to be uh, transit dependent or transit reliant. So this includes people who are 60 or older, people with disabilities, and people who live in zero vehicle households, by which we mean uh, households that do not have reliable and consistent access to a private vehicle. And again, this is seen as the lower bound estimate for transit demand. The mobility gap demand estimate is seen as the higher bound uh, estimate of transit demand, and that's because it introduces travel behavior, not just demographics. Uh, here, there's a, an estimate of the mobility gap, which is seen as the difference in the number of trips taken between a one vehicle household and a zero vehicle household within uh, rural areas. So essentially, this is measuring the, the difference in mobility practices, the difference in travel behavior, uh, between those who have access to a vehicle and those who do not. And uh, the estimate is compared against the current level of uh, rural trips provided by all rural uh, service operators in the Three Rivers area in order to build a gap estimate and then estimate the costs of filling that gap. So in 2019, uh, rural transit providers in the Three Rivers areas provided about 168,000 total trips. But based on our demand estimates, we calculated about 196,000 trips were demanded uh, by the demographics in, uh, in the Three Rivers area, and that uh, up to 727,000 trips were, uh, were demanded under the mobility gap estimate. So this means there was an unmet rural trip demand across uh, the entire region of anywhere from uh, 27,000 trips to 558,000 trips. In order to uh, meet that demand, we estimate the total annual costs, uh, both capital and operating. This is essentially the amount of additional spending that all transit providers across the Three Rivers region would need to expend in order to fill 100% of that demand. Now, we do want to emphasize that's a pretty maximal approach. This isn't a recommendation uh, of how much needs to be spent. Excuse me a second. Sorry about that. Uh, that's a an estimate of how much needs to be spent in order to meet 100% of the demand uh, within this region. And as a result, uh, yeah, again, it, it's not a, a recommendation at this time. 
we do see that transit demand grows uh, when we do our projection out to our horizon year of 2050. This, uh, this level of demand in 2050 is based on projected population growth uh, at the county level, which uh, we take from the uh, Georgia Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, which generates uh, annual population growth estimates through 2065. And because of that uh, population growth, we see that the total estimated rural uh, transit demand increases to 244,000 under the non-program demand assessment and increases uh, to 887,000 under the mobility gap demand estimate, which means again, meeting 100% of this transit demand will require spending about 4.6 million to 16.9 million per year on capital and operating costs. Next slide, please. There's an additional type of demand estimate included in this, uh, which is the commuter transit demand. Uh, while this is also taken from the, the Transit Cooperative Research Program's methodology, we treat it a little differently uh, because it's, it's measuring a different type of demand uh, within uh, the Three Rivers region. Specifically, it's measuring uh, inter-county uh, travel patterns that uh, would, would need to be met with um, commuter transit services, essentially mapping the economic relationships between communities that have a larger residential population and uh, communities that have a larger economic footprint. Essentially, people who want to uh, tra commute from their homes to their to their jobs in offices, factories, hospitals, other sorts of facilities. This uh, demand is based on uh, a proxy estimate uh, of transit demand, uh, specifically using home based work trips uh, estimated by uh, two data sources, the Georgia travel demand uh, model, which analyzes uh, travel behavior within uh, within Georgia, and then another US census database that measures uh, cross county uh, uh, commuter patterns. And so the home based work trips are taken as a proxy estimate because they are essentially representing uh, trips that would be a commute uh, that is not met by another mode of transportation. So essentially someone who works from home could conceivably work in in an office in another county. And based on that, we estimate commuter transit demand as a share of those daily commutes and then calculate an annual commuter transit demand uh, based on a certain number of uh, trips per year. Now, uh, obviously every county has its unique flows but we focus on uh, analyzing counties that have an annual commuter transit demand of at least 100,000 trips or more. This essentially recognizes the fact that uh, you need a certain volume of demand in order to sustain a program, in order to, to justify the capital and operating costs. So what we see is that uh, there are two county uh, inter-county travel patterns that fit this uh, profile, Carroll County to Fulton County, and Cowita County to Fayette County. Now it's worth noting that these are uh, not only inter-county trips, but they're inter-region trips. Both of those destination counties are located in the Atlanta Regional Commission's uh, service area. So it, <clears throat> it might get a little complicated in terms of operating this service and figuring out how costs would be split, but these are the demands, uh, the, the kind of key corridors that we've identified uh, for this study, where you see uh, annual transit demand ranging from 178,000 in 2019 and growing to 186,000 in 2050 for that Carroll to Fulton travel, and then uh, 260,000 in 2019, growing to 328,000 uh, for the Cowita to Fayette travel. Next slide, please. So, Baird, I'm going to just pause there for a second. Um, it's a lot of numbers and a lot of information. So I just want to see if anybody has any questions about what Baird has presented or needs any further explanation. Hearing none, you're doing a great job, Baird. Thank you. All right. We want to shift now and talk a little bit about the qualitative inputs that we've heard so far uh, from the, the two surveys that uh, Matt mentioned earlier. Essentially, 
uh, we've done two surveys out to our, our two stakeholder groups, a provider survey that was distributed directly to the transit providers and a rider survey that was open to the general public. In both cases, we want to understand the needs and priorities for uh, rural and human services transportation in Georgia uh, coming directly from those either responsible for providing the service or those who are using it directly. Both of these are really important perspectives for us to capture. So in the provider survey, uh, we've received 36 responses to date. Uh, we're really happy with that, uh, that response level, but obviously the survey is still open. We encourage you to take it if you haven't taken it already. If you have taken it, uh, thank you. We appreciate your input. Uh, we also encourage you to share it with your, your peers and colleagues, uh, really so that we can get as many voices on this as possible. The responses that we've heard uh, are, are really interesting, definitely uh, speak to the, the challenge that transit, uh, and particularly rural transit, is facing right now, um, both because of more historical issues related to the, the challenge of you know, serving large geographic areas and the more contemporary issues related to COVID and COVID's impacts on the workforce. So what we've heard so far is that uh, fewer than 50% of respondents are able to carry riders to destinations outside their jurisdictional boundaries. And by a ratio of two to one, respondents have not pursued coordinated human services transit or regional service. This is something we definitely see a lot with uh, rural and human services transportation. Uh, again, we recognize these are often small agencies working in large service areas and don't necessarily have the administrative capacity or infrastructure to manage a lot of that interregional coordination. So we're thinking about strategies to address that. We have uh, seen that agencies reported uh, less ridership in 2020 than they did in 2019. Namely, uh, six respondents had fewer than 5,000 trips in 2019, but this has increased to 10 respondents having fewer than 5,000 trips in 2020. So again, seeing it, it, that that's very understandable, we know you know, COVID disrupted a lot of different things. Uh, normal travel patterns, uh, work commutes, a lot of people lost lost their jobs. Uh, tragically, a lot of people lost their lives. So there just might not be as many people needing transit uh, as much. But it speaks to, again, a, a challenging environment that we're trying to uh, pull transit agencies out of, even compared to the, to the base year of 2019 that we've been analyzing. We did ask uh, agencies to also talk about what they were trying to address um, and, and grow from. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, with the uh, we uh, with the uh, question on technology, we asked uh, which uh, which technologies agencies are either using or considering adopting in the future. And while only two respondents indicated that they currently use a smartphone app or website for trip planning and fare payment, eight agencies are considering using this tool. So again, we see a, a turn towards a more tech enabled uh, service that tries to integrate tech into the, the user side, the, the customer side as well, uh, which we know has resulted in a lot of uh, improvements in customer uh, satisfaction within this space. The most common uh, state of good repair need is again, a, a pretty standard, uh, pretty historic need, which is simply purchasing new vehicles, the usual you know, capital needs. But what's interesting is the second highest uh, state of good repair need is establishing regular maintenance schedules. We heard from multiple respondents that they have to uh, essentially share maintenance staff or maintenance resources with other transit providers in their region or with other uh, community facilities. And so they can't necessarily get their repairs needed exactly when they need them, uh, which influences uh, how they can get their vehicles back into service and maintain their service reliability. And again, we we see that uh, that disruption of maintenance schedules as possibly due to COVID as well and its various workforce impacts. Again, you know, a lot of people have changed jobs, left their jobs, or uh, with the tragic loss of life, it uh, impacts the workforce availability and consistency. In opening the question to uh, more to the significant challenges across uh, three areas, administrative challenges, uh, rider satisfaction and funding, we get again a mix of traditional issues for rural and human services transportation, as well as uh, more recent kind of emerging issues related to COVID. So for administrative challenges, we hear uh, that compliance with state and federal reporting is an issue. 
very standard response uh, from rural human ser services transportation providers everywhere. Again, small agencies, small staff still have to meet a lot of reporting requirements. But the other significant administrative challenge was attracting and retaining qualified personnel, where again, we, we hear that as part of the, the COVID workforce impacts now impacting the transit sector as well. Within rider demand and satisfaction, uh, we have the traditional response of uh, the, the challenge with expanding service into new markets, meeting uh, customers' needs across a wider area. I mean, that aligns with some of the things we heard from you folks today earlier. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we, we recognize the, the consistency uh, of that, uh, that challenge. But we also heard a challenge from our providers about dealing with the public perception of transit, uh, which again seems to have taken on additional urgency and additional uh, criticality in, uh, in COVID, where people uh, started to worry about the, their personal safety on transit, the thought of uh, sitting in an enclosed space close to several people, uh, po pose a greater risk to, to them. And so we're trying to combat those risks uh, and change that public perception as we uh, put this plan together. For funding, uh, the most significant issue we heard was securing uh, local funding for capital, uh, for capital expenditures. Again, a, a pretty traditional uh, challenge that we hear in rural and human services transportation since a lot of these counties are running pretty lean uh, staff, pretty lean ships. Uh, they don't necessarily have a lot of uh, local money lying around that isn't already obligated uh, to other operations. So the thought of making those sorts of uh, capital improvements, those capital investments can be a lot harder to come by. Moving to the next slide, uh, we'll pivot to the rider survey. Uh, and again, this is the survey that's gone out directly to the public, uh, getting input on their needs and priorities as it relates uh, to transit. We've received 55 responses to date, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, 85 of those respondents uh, indicated that they do not currently ride transit. This is obviously, uh, this is good for us because we are happy to be hearing from so many people who don't ride transit. We want to understand what those barriers are. Um, we want to understand how we can make it more useful or attractive to people who don't ride transit, but we are hoping to hear from additional transit riders as well, just so we can get uh, additional information and understanding on how to serve our existing customers better. Among those who do ride transit, their main reason for doing so is that they lack access to a vehicle, and they indicate that their most common trip purposes are work, medical appointments, and dialysis appointments. So it, it speaks uh, to the diversity of needs that uh, transit is uh, fulfilling uh, for these uh, individuals. The survey respondents do indicate that if transit were not available, they would likely get a ride from a friend or a family member. That's pretty consistent with what we hear uh, uh, in the, the rural transit sector that, again, you know, people will tap their social networks to find alternatives. It isn't necessarily that they're stranded. But those social networks aren't always very reliable. They're not always easy to navigate and they can be inconsistent at when, you know, people who uh, are using uh, friends and relatives, you know, have their own trips to do, uh, have their own errands to run. And so you can't always rely on that. We want to be able to offer an alternative that meets all, all those needs with greater reliability and consistency. Among those who say they do not ride transit, their most common reasons for doing so are that they are interested, but transit is not convenient, or they are not interested. So again, speaking to that issue of public perception of transit, if people see transit as unsafe or simply not meeting their needs, they, uh, they won't try to find out how to use it. And it's incumbent on us to figure out how to build those sorts of strategies to reach uh, the, the reluctant or hesitant people. Among those who do ride transit, uh, we asked uh, questions about their challenges for using rural and human services transportation, and they indicated that uh, they think it is not reliable enough to use for time sensitive trips like medical appointments or dialysis appointments, that transit does not go where they want to go, which kind of overlaps with what we heard from the transit providers about not being able to expand into new markets or not being able to cross uh, jurisdictional boundaries, or that the distance to the nearest transit service is too far speaking to the first mile, last mile gap that uh, we've been looking at closely in the transit sector. 
we also asked people to indicate their priorities uh, for making transit improvements, the ones that they want to see transit agencies invest in. Uh, we heard a lot of uh, feedback around providing access to jobs, providing access to healthcare, and connecting different parts of the community or region. So again, meeting a diversity of needs and uh, expanding coverage uh, throughout the service area. On the technology side, we asked uh, for their feedback on which uh, elements uh, transit agencies should prioritize. And what we heard was that there's a real appetite for uh, real-time arrival information at transit stops, but also making that information available via smartphone, website, or text. So again, it's helping people uh, gain more information about their about their transit service that helps them rely on it more and trust in its consistency. So it uh, again kind of aligns with some of their priority or their priority concerns or challenges uh, about uh, using transit. And that concludes uh, the needs assessment work that we've done so far. Again, these surveys are still open through the end of the month. Uh, we encourage you to take them, your colleagues to take them, and your constituents as well. All right, thanks, Bear. So we're going to transition into the discussion portion of this workshop. And again, this is where it's going to be really important to hear from you um, about what you want to see out of this plan. Um, maybe you have some ideas about what we should be considering as part of the solution, or maybe you just have some concerns and needs that, that you'd like to express. So again, um, I think most people are joining us through the Teams app, so you can use the raise hand feature or the chat box to enter your questions and comments, and Chiquita will be monitoring those. Uh, if we do have somebody by phone, which I don't believe we do, um, you are welcome to unmute your phone and uh, please uh, speak up. So we do have a series of kind of questions to kind of get you thinking. Uh, you don't have to answer these questions directly, but if you have an answer to these questions, we would love to hear them. Uh, the first is just kind of about your service area and connections. Um, are there needs that we haven't identified or we haven't heard um, from from Baird either through his quantitative assessment or the qualitative information that we heard from the surveys. So can you think of any needs that you have that, that have already been expressed? And then are there missing connections within your region? Or maybe there are missing connections between your region and another region, and there's some sort of barrier that's preventing trips from being provided between those two regions or between different areas of the Three Rivers region. So I'm just gonna leave this up here for a second, kind of get you thinking about it. And hopefully you've got, got some things on your mind that you'd like to share with us. I think we have some representation from the Three Rivers Regional Transit System. Nothing, can't think of anything else that we need to provide. We're, I'm going to move on to some other questions, but keep, keep thinking about those questions. And uh, while I do that, I also want to um, recognize that this presentation is being recorded and it's going to be posted on GDOT's transit website. Uh, so you can share that with your colleagues who may be interested in watching it. And then we're accepting comments and questions up until March 4th. And you can email Matt or myself um, and our email addresses are going to be provided at the end of this presentation. So one, one area that, that we're particularly interested in, especially from the Three Rivers, seeing that you do have a coordinated system, is hearing a little bit about your experience with the coordinated system um, and what kind of lessons learned you have from starting that system or what, what kind of barriers you're still struggling with. Uh, maybe there were some services that you thought you were going to be able to provide because it was coordinated, but you're finding that you cannot. Um, we'd love to hear about those. And then really any any challenges that you have from more coordination, you know, Coweta County, there's three counties in your region that aren't a part of the Three Rivers um, Regional Transit Service. So if you've got some thoughts on, on what those challenges are of bringing those other counties in, maybe it's 
you know, a lack of interest. Um, maybe it's political, maybe it's financial. Um, so any any comments that you all have about your coordinated system that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, this is uh, Tommy Kennedy uh, with Three Rivers. I mean, there are several things that come to mind. Um, we have a lot of variation within the Three Rivers area. We have some areas that are extremely rural, but then we have other areas that are, uh, for lack of a better term, urban, um, you know, but much more densely populated and we're uh, areas that are right outside of the metro Atlanta area. And so there's a wide variety of folks uh, in those areas, uh, particularly in the more rural areas, things are much more spread out and there are some difficulties in, in being able to cross some of the some boundary lines as some those are some barriers to trying to get people from maybe a very rural county into uh, a city for medical care and that kind of, kind of thing and so that's a, a challenge uh, sometimes um, we also ha are dealing with uh, growth in some of our counties uh, and so we're beginning to see that in in new things like in uh, in pike county there's a new va uh, clinic for veterans that's getting ready to open and so we anticipate that we'll probably begin uh, taking some trips there whether they'll be dhs trips or public trips we'll just have to see how that goes um but uh, part of the uh, the struggle that we have is that in the mornings when we're going to a lot of the dhs centers uh, whether it's a senior center or a dbhd uh, center is a lot of our buses are full and then that prevents us from being able to take other people who want to like get to and from work. So if if we could just double the size of our fleet uh, in the morning and the afternoon and then shrink it back uh, for the rest of the day, then we probably would be fine. <laughs> uh, but that's certainly not an option. Um, and so that's that's a challenge uh, to try to be able to provide uh, as much service as we possibly can. Are you uh, sorry now that I have I, I've got more follow-up questions and if you don't know the answer to them that's fine do you, do you find that you have trouble providing um adequate service in those rural areas because the trips that are being taken because everything's so spread apart takes a long time you know that you're you're spending your vehicle hours you know transporting on this one trip and then therefore you're not able to accommodate a lot of the other trips that are maybe in the more dense areas that I think that's that's part of the part of the challenge is just because things geographically are spread out in some of the more rural areas and and certainly uh, you know the uh, the folks that live in the more rural areas need to have access to medical care and there are a lot further distance from that and so there are people that we you know certainly want to try to transport as much as we can. Um, another follow up question to your to your vehicles: Have y'all ever looked into? trying to like basically borrow vehicles during your peak hours like from other organizations that maybe aren't using them we we haven't and and i'm i've only been with the organization for about a year but uh but we you know we actually recently had a thought from someone about uh, trying to look at ways that we may be able to, to do that and maybe be able to deal with it um so those are some things that we're exploring um we're also exploring things like van pooling which is not really DHS, but that, you know, could provide services for other folks and take some load off to allows us to transport more people on buses mm -hmm. and to centers. And so the whole, whole big picture is there. But I guess our biggest challenge right now, though, is that our, our DHS revenues are down probably about to about 60 percent of what they were uh, pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and since those are in the 5311 program are matching funds uh, that's taken a pretty significant hit uh, for us financially and in, in trying to figure out our path forward and on top of that when you have all the inflation and uh, costs are a lot higher so that's kind of a one-two punch that makes it really difficult for us as we're trying to navigate through those financially yeah yeah for sure um Okay, well, well, thank you, Tommy. Appreciate all the input. Thank you for letting me to letting me direct some additional questions your way. My pleasure. Anyone else have have any thoughts, comments?
Um, I, th I think, you know, what what y'all are experiencing is, is very similar to what we're hearing in the survey. Um, and, you know, what, what we're hearing not only across the state, but what we're seeing across the nation, especially with these COVID impacts. Um, so, you know, while it seems like funding has gotten better for transportation over the years, at least since the last update back in 2011, when there was like, seemed like there was zero funding. Um, it seems like funding is still still a major constraint for um, for providers. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. We have a few other questions. Again, just keep your keep your brains flowing. Um, so we've talked about gaps in service and providing additional service and meeting um, meeting those demands, but what are some other needs that you have outside of your service area? Uh, I think during the Mintmeter poll, we heard staffing issues, labor shortages, driver shortages. Um, so, you know, what kind of operating administrative needs do you have? Is it just more drivers? Is it more money to fund those drivers? Is it more money to provide higher wages to keep your drivers? Um, are you finding that you can find people who uh, already have appropriate training? Or are you having to provide that training? Any thoughts? Tommy. Yeah, I mean, I jump, I jump back in. I mean, if hey. I had a million dollars and uh, that I could spend, uh, I mean, one of the first things that I would probably do is, is increase driver pay. Okay. Um, we've actually lost drivers to go to work for fast food places and they've gotten a raise, um, which is kind of crazy uh, that that's the case. Um, but the drivers are the unsung heroes in the, in the process. Uh, they do a lot for a very low pay and it's probably similar across the state. Um, but, uh, but that is, this definitely something that I would, you know, try to figure out a way to to increase driver pay if that's possible. Okay. Um, you know, and then of course we always also have uh, uh, staffing issues in in trying to staff up to where we can um, manage it administratively um, to be able to administer the program to where um, not only we're maintaining what we have but looking at ways that we can expand into other areas. Mm -hmm. Do you find constraints with the reporting like we heard in the survey? Uh, there is a lot of reporting. Um, and uh, one of the things I've tried to encourage people in our areas to try to consolidate as much as possible. So, so there's not multiple organizations all trying to do the same kind of reporting. Yeah. And so that's there, there is an economy of scale on, on, on doing that. But then, you know, there are local governments that, that may choose to do some different things because of different reasons and that's okay um but there is uh, a good bit of, re of, of reporting and things meetings and things uh, you got the gdot side and then you have the uh, dhs side those are two main areas where we're going back and forth and sometimes uh, their requirements are a little bit different um, i just throw this in as well as that um, right now the way that the dhs system works is that DHS will type into a, a system called TRIPS um, and order the TRIPS, which is is great and used for billing and everything else. But GDOT uh, has us using a QRIDE system for actually operating and, and taking everyone where they need to go. So every trip that's typed into that TRIPS system has to be printed out and then hand typed back into the QRIDE system. And if you guys could somehow figure out a way for us to upload those, mm -hmm. uh, that would save a massive amount of manpower. I've, I've mentioned this multiple times in other scenarios, but I'll just keep talking about it because if we could do it, it would save so much time. We could spend more time on customer service and, and increasing the quality of what we do instead of having typing errors and other things that relate to that. Great point. Thank you. I like and Tommy, that. I'll jump in real quick. This is Carrie with GDOT. I was actually in the process of sending you an email now that an update has been established in HB Assist that will allow you to download all of your trips data and then upload it into QRIDE. Yeah, is there a jumping up and down uh, thing? I can see the <laughs> hand raised. But... 
That's great. That's great. I know. Is there an applaud? Yeah. Yeah, that's OK. Great. Thank you, Carrie. All right. Tommy, do you still have another question? I see your OK. <laughs> your hand is raised or is the button just still pushed in? Okay. I, I was I was trying to trying to find the thing where I could jump up and down and celebrate. You have that on Zoom, but you don't have that here. So <laughs> are there any more questions or um, comments that people want to make? Of course, uh, if you can't think of anything right now, we definitely will give you the opportunity to uh, submit your questions later. But this is the perfect opportunity and time to ask questions or have comments so that we can gather this information um, that's really, really vital to us right now. So I know Amanda, Carrie, Avery, Tommy has been amazing. Holly, Corey, any of you have comments, questions? Going once, going, once. going twice. Yeah, I'm going to jump back in then. <laughs> Again, sorry about that guy. Please. Well, as I as I think about it, you know, one of the areas we, we want to try to expand in if we can is is what we call purchase of service revenue. And mm -hmm. and uh, we want to look at at finding ways for us to connect to uh, so, you know some of the Medicaid trips and that type of stuff and see if that's feasible for us uh, to be able to do that. We may not be able to do all of them, but to be able to do some of them, particularly since sometimes we have capacity during some time today and not others. And it, that might be a good way to uh, to increase our revenues, make a make a bigger difference for uh, uh, the people that we're transporting. And uh, since we have some areas that are actually going to be transitioning to uh, portions of 5307 funding sometime in the near future, that would also, also help them in, in doing that. So just to make sure that I understand correctly and that others on the other others on the call understand. So when you talk about purchase of surface revenue, that is purchasing um, or that is providing trips for non-emergency medical transportation and basically acting as a third party operator under the brokerage system for DCH. I believe that that's correct. It's it's Medicaid trips. Yep, Medicaid trips right. um, and that then the Department of Community Health or their brokers would then um, pay you to provide those trips. And you could do that during certain times of day where you have more capacity. Right. I mean, it would be a more efficient use of the system if, if there's a way to work that out. That's kind of a longer range thing that we're exploring. Okay. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, and again, I'm trying to think back 10 years ago. Um, if I remember correctly, I think one of the constraints that DCH had is that they can't they can't pre they can't predict when these trips need to be made or how long the trip is going to take because if they go to like dialysis that can that can vary in time and they have very strict on time performance standards so i think they feel like they're it, they they need their third party operators to be 100% committed to those medicaid trips um, and I remember that's where some of the challenges were of these purchase of service contracts. Okay. So, sounds like that's still still relevant and something that that we need to look into to see if there's any flexibility. Um, and maybe there is with some technology now that scheduling technology has become more advanced. So. Definitely want to look at those things. I just this is Matt. Just jump in on that conversation. You know, we talk with a couple other providers who have regional service, and they operate they operate as an an EMT broker and as a sub recipient in that system, and also work with DHS trips. So, having one uh, transit provider provide all three types of trips in a region is a pretty significant step forward, and so. There's a couple lessons learned and activities we can talk about uh, on a separate call um, and 
hook you guys up together about ways in which to implement uh, that service. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Matt. Okay, anything else before we kind of wrap this up? Not kind of, before we wrap it up? Okay, Matt, I'll let you. Awesome. Well, um, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for the time this afternoon. Uh, just to review our schedule one more time, we are working on the existing conditions assessment, uh, which your information will help us uh, complete, and the alternative analysis. And we will start the development of the final draft report in the coming months. Uh, we are targeting July for publishing the draft final report, which will be published on our website. Um, once again, I want to thank you so much for your participation in today's workshop. Uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to um, myself or Kirsten with any questions or comments on the information we shared today. Also, we ask that you complete our survey, uh, whether you're a provider of RCST services or ride on those services, we want to hear from you. Uh, if you are on the phone, you can find these surveys at www.dot.ga.gov slash transit. Uh, we do ask that you send any questions uh, in by March 4th, so we have time to respond to them. Uh, and finally, thank you all again so much for the time this afternoon and appreciate all the comments.